Welcome back. This is Jay, and today I'm embarking on a grand adventure. Out from the Underhive and the Sump Sea, and into the Ash Waste. For the next eight weeks, I'll be creating videos dedicated to the Ash Wastes. In October, I'm running an Ash Wastes campaign, and the second week of November is Ash Wastes Weekend. So join me today as I begin my journey by discussing how I will run the October Ash Waste Campaign, this time on JD in the Sump Sea. Let's take a look at what Games Workshop says is an Ash Waste campaign. So here's the Ash Waste rulebook. Let's turn to the Ash Waste campaign. An Ash Waste campaign is similar to a Dominion campaign in many ways. In a Dominion campaign, you fight over territories. In an Ash Waste campaign, you fight over road sections. In a Dominion campaign, you have three phases. Each phase consists of cycles. Three cycles in the first phase, one in the second phase, three in the third phase. In an Ash Waste campaign, you have the same structure. In the past, before the Ash Waste box set was released, Dominion campaigns have usually been structured so that each phase consists of cycles, and those cycles are one week, and within that one week you play one game. This one game per week for three weeks worked just fine in a, Dom in a Dominion campaign, and sure you could modify this to stretch it out to two weeks or even a month, would just be one cycle so everyone could play two or four or even more games per cycle. The problem with stretching out to two weeks or three or even a month or more is that many times people get tired of playing and the campaign sputters out after a month or so. Uh, or another thing is that one player shoots out ahead of the others and becomes nearly unbeatable. This is why I think Dominion campaigns are many times fought over seven weeks or seven weeks for the campaign, one cycle equals one week, and then one battle per player per week. It's nice, easy, compact. It's not too long, it's not too short, and hopefully no one gets too far ahead. In a Dominion campaign, you fight over territories, and each week or cycle you collect income from the territories. And the income is always one or two or 3d6 times 10. So your income, combined with the rewards from winning scenarios, gives you plenty of money to buy stuff. In the days prior to the current rulebook that just came out, um, the XP was proportionally much smaller than the cash income, and it was pretty obvious, so people advanced their gangs through buying things with their money, but not through spending XP. The current rulebook has fixed the XP issue to a degree, which is great because Games Workshop seems to be listening to us, but also actually playing and play testing their own game. So the current rulebook gives you a Dominion campaign that most people will play over 7 weeks with good income and good XP earning throughout it. Now compare that to what Ash Waste does. In an Ash Waste campaign you fight for road sections. And that's great, but look at that, the money you collect from road sections each cycle. No, this is not a typo. 2d6, 3d6, maybe even just d6 credits. That's not much money. In one cycle of collecting income from one road section, you can't even get enough to buy an auto gun, usually, and definitely not a ganger. This is so much different than the Dominion campaign where you get a settlement territory to start that earns you 2d6 times 10, and you can possibly get a free ganger or juve each week. But road sections aren't all there is. There are also trade routes. There really aren't many trade routes either compared to road sections. The real money is trade routes, but sometimes a trade route is three or four road sections. It would take too long to acquire enough road sections for some of these trade routes, more even than there are weeks in a campaign. Again, if we consider a cycle as a week and each player plays one game per week. So playing an Ash Waste campaign straight out of the book, where you equate a cycle to a week and a week each player plays one game just doesn't work. Now we have five weeks to play an Ash Waste campaign before we go to the Ash Waste weekend and play a com uh, contained Ash Waste campaign over three days. My gaming group meets every Thursday at the store. We're currently in a perpetual campaign where whoever shows up plays one game that's arbitrated by D. And we want to keep that formula of one game per week. So I had to modify some things. 
I also don't know how many players will be there any given week, and I don't know how many total we'll have in the campaign. I'm the arbitrator for this campaign, and I also want to play in it. So let's take a look at the packet I have made, and what I did to make a five week long, five games played per player Ash Waste campaign. Okay, so here's my packet, and I start off with Gang Organization. So I've kept this fairly standard with 1,000 credits plus 400 for vehicles. I made sure that custom vehicles are allowed. Where I've deviated was with adding the opportunity to start with a hangers-on. I think in a limited campaign like this one, that giving people the possibility of starting with a hangers-on can give players more opportunity to not only use hangers-on they may not normally use, but also to actually have hangers-on do something during a campaign. Some people may not have bought one before because they didn't have the credits or because they were non-combatants, which makes them seem not as necessary. I've also created two new hangers on that I want people to have the opportunity to try that we'll go over those later. One additional rule that my buddy running the Ash Waste Weekend has created is the option to jump off your mount during a game. I've decided to include that ability here as a basic action. I want to give it a try and see how it plays. The next section is tactics cards. The method I chose for this campaign is the same method we're using at the store right now for our perpetual campaign. This method is similar to two of the new methods described in the new rulebook, and can I just say that I'm really happy that they added in several methods for using tactics cards? I think GW should really have thought about them more when they introduced them to Necromunda back in 2017. Anyways, the method we're using for this campaign is each player builds a deck of 12 cards. They can have no more than one of each card in the deck. Each game, the players pick two cards from their deck that they want to use for that game, regardless of the scenario rules. When they use a card, it is discarded and cannot be used again unless they run through all of their cards and then the deck is rebuilt. If they don't use a card during a game, it goes back to the deck. This method is also compatible with people who don't actually have the physical cards. They just write down on a piece of paper which tactics cards they have for their gang, then select the two they want to use for that game from the list. Okay, so the next page specifically covers the campaign rules. So I've done something different here than the normal Ash Waste campaign does. Uh, I've given each player a trade route to start the campaign with. I want to turbocharge this campaign since there will only be five weeks and five games played for each player. I've used three trade routes from the Ash Waste rulebook and created ten more. I've used only existing road sections and made sure that each trade route is either one or two road sections at most. Each trade route I created connects two locations on the map. Later in the packet I list the roads and the trade routes. The next section, the campaign cycles section, describes how the campaign will play out. There are five cycles consisting of one week, and each week each player plays one game. After week three is downtime, which only lasts until the next week. There is no week of downtime. It is between. It is a between weeks event. No games are played during downtime, but each gang will receive 250 credits. Their fighters will come out of recovery, and experienced juves and prospects can be elevated to champion status if they qualify. All cycles exist during Necromunda's Season of Flame, which means each week players play for uncontrolled road sections and won't be able to challenge for other players' controlled road sections unless there are no road sections left available. If we're playing with four players or even six players in this campaign, uh, there will be plenty of road sections and no one will have to fight other players for their road sections. But if there's more than six players, then that's definitely a possibility. Now, because this campaign is only fought during the season of flame, it also um, leaves this campaign open-ended. So once players have gathered all the road sections and trade routes that they can in this campaign, then in a future campaign, they could play those games again and just we could, we could just do the season of Ash. So we just take over road sections and trade routes from other players. And the triumphs that I'll show later on in this packet um, can be used by those gangs in that future campaign should we run one. All right, so the next page goes over the weekly schedule of games. This chart 
shows which games will be played each week and what the weather will be for that week's games. I also have underdog scenarios listed because if someone is an underdog, they'll have the opportunity to select an underdog scenario instead of a regular scenario. Week 1 has no underdog scenario because everyone will be on the same level, and Week 5 has no underdog scenario because everyone will play in the same game. The weather conditions are listed below the chart, so players don't have to look up weather in the book. If a gang has the ability to adjust the mission they play, then they can choose to play the underdog scenario that week, or the Dust Bowl skirmish from the Ash Waste rules book. Another mission that could be played is the rescue mission if they desire. So let's talk about the scenarios for a minute. The first mission is the Bone Road Death Race. I thought having a race be the first mission could be a fun thematic game to start the campaign with. Three of the five scenarios are rolling roads and that's on purpose. I really want this to feel more like a Mad Max environment where everyone has vehicles and they're trying to get from place to place in this really remote, empty, dangerous environment. The underdog missions came from two different White Dwarf magazines. Issue 476 has Desperate Raid and Assassinate and issue 482 has Cargo Raid. In Desperate Raid, the attacker is the underdog, starts in the middle of the battlefield, and each of their gangers has a loot casket in their possession. They have to escape from the board edges with loot caskets to win the game. They're basically stealing money and supplies from the enemy's camp. The underdog receives D6 times 10 credits for each loot casket they escape with at the end of the, at the, end of the game. It's a great way for them to earn credits and to get back in the game. In Assassinate, the underdog targets a specific champion or leader of the enemies and they have to take them out of action. And if they succeed, they win the game and it ends right there. They get 6d6 times 10 credits for taking out their target. Again, this mission, if the underdog can win it, will give them a great boost in credits to help get them back on their feet in the campaign. The Cargo Run Underdog mission is a rolling roads mission, and the underdogs deploy 18 inches from the trailing edge while the defenders deploy 6 inches. The defenders have 3 loot crates, and they're trying to hold on to them for the whole battle. If the underdog takes out 2 loot crates, they win. They get D6 times 5 credits for each crate they destroy, but the real victory for the underdogs is the experience they get from the mission. One experience just for showing up, one experience for each hull point removed, and D3 experience for each crate they destroy. They also earn D3 rep for winning. The final mission, the big score, is from the Bullet Road Apocrypha PDF from Warhammer Community. If you aren't aware of these PDFs, then go to the Warhammer Community webpage and search for Apocrypha, and all of the articles show up. This mission is another Rolling Roads mission. The defender sets up their gang within six inches of the center of the board and picks their most expensive vehicle to be the prize. Then everyone else deploys on the trailing edge. The scenario says within one inch of the trailing edge, but if they have vehicles, I don't know how that's going to be possible. So I'll just say they deploy on the edge. So the defender with the prize will probably be the gang with the highest gang rating for this mission. I may not use my normal gang for this mission and instead play a totally different gang not from this campaign as the gang with the prize just to switch things up. It could be fun having every gang gang up on over on an overpowered gang I create just for this mission to see if they can win the prize. The winner of this mission gets 46 times 10 credits and D3 rep. So it's possible that too that this win could propel a gang to win a triumph also. All right. On the next page, this page shows the map of the Ash Waste with the trade routes grayed out that have more than two road sections. We just aren't playing with those in this campaign because I want people to complete trade routes and with only five games to do that I figured the smaller the trade routes the better. Plus this leaves the longer routes for a future campaign. The next page goes over the trade routes and the road sections. This page not only lists all of the routes and road sections, but explains how road sections are picked to fight over. Each week, the player with the highest gang rating picks a road section and a player to play a game against for that uncontrolled road section. Then the next player below that, who isn't in a challenge, picks a road and player and etc. etc. If there are a lot of people in this campaign and all the roads are taken, the people can start challenging others' controlled roads. If there's a tie, then the road remains uncontrolled, or it goes back to the gang who controlled it before the game started. The next page goes over the different regional waste effects. I only chose three for each zone, and I chose easy ones that still allow for a game of Necromunda to be played. 
I tried to simplify this campaign and codify everything so it's easy to play week to week and so that I could play it play in it as well because it's already spelled out as to how it runs from week to week. Um, one reason why I say I wanted it to be actually a game of Necromunda is that there are some uh, effects that basically mean the floor is lava, even for vehicles. And when that happens, if you combine that with visibility, you can't move, you can't see anything. If you try to move, you probably die and basically you're not playing a game of Necromunda. You're playing really nothing. So that's why I took out certain effects and only left certain ones in so that we actually get to play an actual game. <laughs> All right, so the next page is the second to last page and it has my new hangers on that I created. I also sent these to my buddy running the Ash Waste Weekend and he'll be using them there as well. So this will be a good way to try these out before that event by allowing us to purchase them at Gang Creation. We should get plenty of use out of them. I made a mechanic that makes it easier to fix your vehicles and easier to procure parts for them. The other guy is a driving instructor. I like the idea of a crew of a vehicle getting better at driving their vehicles and also just becoming better drivers as they drive more. So the last page is the Triumphs. The rewards seem quite good, but again, who knows if we'll actually get to the Season of Ash campaign with these same gangs. If we do, then they're experienced and will have some advantages. And if we don't, well, then the players still get the brag that they were, say, the Roadmasters or the Wadded One. This is the one that I made up. Uh, the other ones are all in the book, as far as the Triumph name and the criteria. The last one I made up, the Wadded One, is the wealthiest gang. So whoever is the wealthiest at the end of the campaign wins this triumph. And what they get in a future campaign would be a plus one reputation and 500 additional credits added onto their gang at the end from this campaign for the next game, next campaign. So pretty good. Um, that's the packet. That's it for the first video of my new series, Eight Weeks of Ash Wastes. In my next video, I'll build a gang for this campaign and for the Ash Waste Weekend in November. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe.